So the long title that we chose for today's reflection is Contentment Without Complacency, Escaping the Tyranny of Grasping or the Tyranny of Wanting. And um, one of the reasons uh, this topic is uh, very up for me is because I just spent about three weeks uh, with my grandchildren and they're four and a half and two and a half, actually in uh, Nanaimo. Um, there's a couple of Canadians on. Um, I also am Canadian, grew up in Canada, grew up in Vancouver. And my daughter lives in Nanaimo with her husband and her two children. And um, it, the tyranny of grasping, the tyranny of wanting that we all live under in within our own inner world, our own mind is so unfiltered, so blatant, so in your face when you're with little children. And it was heartbreaking. I, I mean, it's just a reality. And um, it was so obvious when my grandchildren would get caught so much more obvious than how we get caught and how sophisticated all of our rational Asians are and um, there would be times uh, their names are Adam uh, Ivan and Odessa my um, grandson is Ivan and we would uh, invariably you know I would be offering them something and of course, we would have two because there's two children. And Ivan would get so caught on like he would pick this one and then no, 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 that one. And if his sister wanted the one in this hand, then that's the one he wanted. And Ivan, bless your heart, these are exactly the same. They're exactly the same. And uh, but he would, you know, I want that one. No, no, actually, and sometimes he would grab it and then he would switch with his sister and it was so it was so obvious that it he was suffering and it, it wasn't meeting the need that he thought it was going to meet or we would be playing some wonderful game and um something really uh spontaneous and lovely would happen and then he immediately grab it and want it again and then he would even be like telling me the script and telling me how to say the words so that we'd recreate this wonderful experience that he had had or uh, bless his heart, where um, I told them the story of the three billy goats gruff. Uh, one of the last days I was there and then we're acting it out and it's all fun and, and light and connected. And he and his sister are actually taking uh, part, taking roles. And, and so um, I thought he would enjoy being the troll and she's little. So I let her be the baby goat and then you could see in Ivan's mind, he was having a great time, but then he was rolling forward that, oh, then they're going to switch parts and he's going to be the middle sized goat and then she's going to get to be the big goat. And then he stops it and, he, and, he, and he's trying to control who will be what role when and it was and it was awful. And uh, so it's really up for me seeing it so blatantly with them, um, how that plays out in my own mind and my own day-to-day uh, -day life is wanting. Um, and the reason that it's so important for us to talk about is I, I think that this is really the the nugget of uh, obviously non-self is the real nugget that the Buddha discovered, but um, the trap that we're all in because of the delusion of self is this tyranny of grasping and of wanting and trying to get and trying to control and, 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 and trying to manipulate um, life. Uh, so it, uh, the counter to it, a counter, the real counter to it is insight and wisdom. But along the way, something the Buddha is pointing our, us to, to cultivate is contentment. 
And um, so that's kind of the big picture and how, how important contentment is. And it is part of the Noble Eightfold Path. It's, it's, it's tied up for monastics. It's tied up with right livelihood because our instructions are very explicit to be content with our four requisites, with our robes, with the alms food that we're receiving, with the lodgings that we're being provided with, and for um, the medicines that are being um, given to us by our supporters. And, um, you know, right livelihood comes right before right effort, and, and contentment really lies there in the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, that it is part of right effort for us to be cultivating contentment. And um, along with that, fewness, fewness of wishes, which is really linked to contentment. Contentment is very linked to um, uh, the amount of desires that we have and the kinds of expectations that we have. Would this be a good time to, oh, I was going to look at sources. Yeah, please. Um, and just, just to underscore uh, what, what the Buddha is instructing us, um, I'm going to read a, a very short section from a sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, the, um, the numbered discourses. And it's in the Book of Sixes. And the Buddha says, and this is a, a translation by Bhante Sujato, and it really um, makes this very alive and poignant because Bhante Sujato has chosen to translate the, the literal Pali word for non-greed as actually contentment. And I, and I think that that's valid, that, that contentment is a countering greed and, and uh, and the opposite of greed. So mendicant, there are these three sources that give rise to deeds. What three? Greed, hate, and delusion are sources that give rise to deeds. Greed doesn't give rise to contentment. Rather, greed just gives rise to greed. And then um, counter that, the, the opposite. Mendicants, there are these three sources that give rise to deeds. What three? Contentment love and understanding are sources that give rise to deeds. Contentment doesn't give rise to greed. Rather, contentment just gives rise to contentment, to more contentment. Aya came at, were you gonna say no, something? No, I was hoping okay. you would. Okay, so um, last thing I'll say before I pass it to Aya Niemeka is um, this wonderful, uh, pithy truth I read in a Ayakena um, uh, translation of uh, or transcription of one of her talks, and she's saying that there's no end to more, but there is an end to less. There's no end to more. But there is an end to less. So that brings me to um, in the United States, we have this thing called the American dream. And uh, I know that Canadians like to believe they, they don't buy into that, but <laughs> <That's> uh, different. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I imagine there's, there's the Canadian <laughs> dream too. Um, <laughs> and that definition may shift from generation to generation, from different groups within our social structures, but there's that label of the American dream that's kind of put on by the greater society. And that might look something like um, living the American dream, owning one's own home, having a family, plenty of money, a second car, a boat, a second home, and I'm sure you can send that list on and on and on. 
but we probably each have our own version of whatever our dream is or our, our American dream or our anti-American dream or <laughs> our, <laughs> you know, um, our, our many dreams that are flavored by this societal edge for more, for more. And my version was not necessarily that mainstream version. Uh, mine was more about intellectual success. Uh, that I would be achieving something, that I would be um, seeking to, to prove something, solve something, invent something. Uh, and I was actually pretty good at it when I was in my 20s. And I remember a conversation with my mother on the phone with her and saying, well, mom, I just did this. I don't even remember what it was. I don't remember what I had just achieved, <laughs> which is telling. Um, I got some funding for a project or I received some award or something, some, something that quote, meant something in, in that achievement cycle. And my mother said, oh, that's wonderful. And, you know, and, and I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Next, I'm going to. Next, I'm going to. I couldn't even be with what I had just achieved, my dream. I just achieved this. I'm on to the next thing. And there was this pause on the phone line. And my mother kind of, I felt sadly said, oh, sweetheart, you'll be happy in this life, but you'll never be content. You'll be happy in this life. You know, the temporary happiness of I just achieved or I just met or someone saw me in this, but you'll never be content. And it was like a splash of cold water, which I mean, I, I, I thank the wisdom of my mother you now, because she was pointing out to me the difference between following that societal tyranny of greed and looking toward what is nourishing in the heart and one can be with in a sustained way. So I'd like us to look at what is it that we can cultivate? It's not a yeah, 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 next I'm going to. Or, or no, 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 I want that one. <laughs> Whether it's our four-year-old version or our 20 whatever-year-old version or you know, our ages now. You know, what is it that we can cultivate? And before we get to that, I want to mention what I think of as the near enemy of contentment, which is complacency. Oh, so often it's like we don't feel like we're going to, we don't need to be a part of the societal solution. It'll, it, it, we're just going to be content with things as they are. We don't really actually need to get involved. And, um, you know, speaking as a white person, that's something that I can, you know, get away with doing in some social issues. You know, I don't need to get involved. I, it, things are okay enough for me. And so I'd like us to not go into that kind. That's not contentment. That's, that's turning away. That's blinding ourselves to, to the world that we're living in. That, that's um, not treating ourselves in a liberating way. It's not treating our world in a liberating way. So it's not complacency. It's not turning the eyes aside. It's cultivation. And one of the things that you see contentment paired with in the suttas is fewness of wishes. And fewness of wishes is that area where we need to be careful not to pick it up as um, 
well, I guess I don't need that. You know, the, the kind of like, um, um, Martyr. martyrdom. Yeah, thank you. That's exactly, it, it's not a martyrdom sort of, I can bear it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Oh, whatever. Like, whatever. I don't mind. I don't mind. That's a big one. I don't mind. Whatever, whatever you want. It's okay. But it can be those same phrases with a different tone because the other thing that contentment gets paired with in the suttas is contentment and gratitude. So if we bring together our fewness of wishes and gratitude, this is definitely a monastic practice of fewness of wishes for the, the robes, the alms food, the lodging, the medicines. And believe me, you can apply it in lay life as well, even though I know there are some more complications you have to deal with. To keep those wishness, wishes few with gratitude. The gratitude is, is an antidote to me to that greed. It's like when I'm grateful for what I have and not in that kind of martyrdom kind of way, but in this really alive and um, meeting the moment kind of way, then I'm connecting with things as they are, just like we did in the, in the um, meditation, you know, meeting the body as it is. Well, then when we practice in the world, we meet all of this as it is. When we're offered two things, and we don't even think they're identical, and we end up with one of them, we can really see the value and the benefit and also the connection with the, the, the giver of that object or offering. So fewness of wishes, and then the um, it's okay. Instead, if we use it as an inquiry, this is what we have here. Can this be okay? Can this be okay? In this moment, it's like this now. Can this be okay? And using it with that heart of like curiosity, it's an inquiry. And for me, that opens up the door to cultivation, cultivating contentment. Uh, and then I will open it up so we can actually have a conversation about this. But the last item I wanna bring in is where you practice contentment. And for me, it's every moment, every moment, this moment right now, can I be content with this? And if you can ask yourself the question, can I be content with this? Can this be okay? You already have enough spaciousness. Your life is not like um, imminently gone. You're not taking your last breath. And if you can practice well enough, you can actually do this at your last breath. But if you have the space to say, is this okay? It's okay. <laughs> your nervous system is not so off balance at that moment. If you can ask, is it okay? You're okay enough to ask the question. There is that much space at least for contentment to come in. And it can be the beginning of cultivating it. So is this a good time to open it up? Yeah, definitely. All right. So we'd love to open this up because we know there's actually a lot of wisdom out there. And what we, we've got 12 boxes on this screen, 12 parts of the world. What is it you do to cultivate contentment? And you could also start with, um, you know, how have you dealt with the opposite of contentment? You can come at it from either way. And I don't know if there's a common method here for um, people just, okay, so you can raise, uh, you can do the little virtual hand or you can actually just raise a physical hand. And then the names here are so small. I wonder if we can actually just kind of do popcorn style. Um, and if I see that uh, if, if someone's not participating and you know, uh, I'm gonna just, give an invitation because I can't really call on names, but I will try to give invitations at time to make sure that if someone has a quieter voice that there's space for that voice. So, but anyone may start. 
Sheila, please. You can read? Oh, great. Thank you. Just remember. This is really up for me. Um, and um, contentment hit me like a ton of bricks yesterday. Um, my financial life is basically in chaos right now, I, I must say. Mm -hmm. And in my figuring things out because I'm a problem solver, gotta fix it, take care of it. And in my brain, you know, that mechanism, how can I fix this? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna handle it? It came to me, just be with what's going on. Um, and it will be okay. Um, and just to even say this out loud is super huge. But in realizing that trying to, oh, I know who I can call and they can help me out. It's like, that is just not being with mm -hmm. what's up. Sure, I could go do this and a friend will totally help me out of it. But that's just, you know, pouring, you know, some strawberry mix on a really bad recipe or something. <laughs> So I just said, no, I'm not going to, quote, ask for help. I'm going to be with the situation that I'm in. And I will move through it and be content with where things are and mm -hmm. my ability to move and shift. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sheila, you, you should give the Dhamma reflection. <laughs> There's a lot. I mean, that, yeah, it says it all. A lot of courage. Yeah. I can volunteer to go. Yeah, please. Rupa? Um, like, I'm 53, divorced, and trying to meet someone, and it's really hard. And a guy I was speaking to for seven months and who looked promising just said no and just last weekend so what i am sitting with is how do i sit with the pain mm -hmm. and still try to move forward and like there are no easy answers but something that's helped me is things like sitting with the meditation mm -hmm. or the art of living Mm -hmm. breathing techniques mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just small steps mm -hmm. and the hardest thing is just to be kind to myself and believe that things will get better yeah. and I don't know if you're popcorning or just anyone volunteers maybe anyone volunteers is better mm -hmm. thank you thank you for sharing Rupa Yes, with contentment, it's really an in this moment thing. So it's not that I'm content with what I had in the past <laughs> or content with what might happen in the future. It's content with the process I'm in right now. And the process I'm in right now might be surprise or shock, or it might be heartache, or it might be um, you know, just a letting go of what I thought might 
be or what I used to have. And so when I'm working with contentment, it's not that I'm not doing the things to care for that future, but I'm doing it in my heart here, in my heart now. And that sense of contentment is being with the, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work out. It's not even dreaming that it will work out. Because it's not asking, can this be okay in the future? Contentment is about asking, can it be okay right now? Right now. So it's actually, it's a really difficult but incredibly freeing practice. I, I think the two people that have shared, oh, oh, and then, and then Tell Adam, um, uh, I think the two people that have shared, you know, um, Sheila and Rupa, I, boy, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about finances and we're talking about relationship. These are like two huge, I oh. mean, and the other one would be health, you know, I mean, either, this is sort of it, like, this is the, really the nuts and bolts of okayness and, and, um, yeah, I think to, to realize contentment is not like a, a, a warm, fuzzy, you know, glow inside. It, I really think that Sheila's hitting the nail on the head that when you, I mean, everyone, I, we all are, it, it, and you're just describing it. I mean, there is this incredible uh, relief that comes from reality, mm -hmm. even when the reality is Blah. our, our <sighs> deepest fear. Yeah. There's something um, incredibly freeing about showing up for that fear like being present and I, it's so yeah i mean contentment there's a lot of presence in contentment um adam you wanted to share something yeah absolutely and it's really interesting like as i sit here reflecting and from what's been shared and and what have you there's a few thoughts that i'll try and verbalize coherently but um like i think about contentment and it's it's really like i i sat this morning um and uh was was quite settled and after my sit i i i felt appreciative for for the contentment not that i consciously verbalized it in that way at the at the time and but i did consciously compare it to recently when uh i was overcome with greed for instance and the 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 impact <laughs> you know the 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 uh dichotomy between mm -hmm. the impact of those of, of those two two things and uh you know i'm grateful i i was able to do that this morning because i'm not often or not always you know like i always think of uh that pithy kind of saying that Rick Hansen, the neuroscientist, talks about like our, our brain has evolved to be um, Teflon for good experiences and Velcro for, for bad experiences. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, so I think a big part of like contentment is like really appreciating it would like so for instance or also like that feeling when you are like meditating and lost in thought and what have you and then you release, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. release that like mm -hmm. appreciating that moment right there longer than it, just letting it kind of drink it in a little bit more mm -hmm. Than, mm -hmm. so yeah those are some of the things i thought about mm -hmm. Um, Toby, please. Oh, okay. Here I, I was getting the phone. Thank you. So for me, um, for a while now, um, I have been kind of in a vortex of um, past thoughts that I think I hold myself responsible for a situation of um, one of my children. 
and and I have been coming to a sense the contentment for me as painful as these past thoughts are I'm actually okay with it because I sit with it and I know that there's no blame, no fault. I sit with a lot of forgiveness, but just being able to get to the point that I can meditate on it and sit with it and actually be okay mm -hmm. and know that things are gonna be okay or they actually already are, is just really huge for me because before mm -hmm. I would just beat myself up every day about mm -hmm. things where now I can see a different view and actually sometimes just be content with the sadness and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. work, you know, just mm -hmm. that's where I am. That's what I'm content with. Mm -hmm. And know that in this moment, it's just a thought that's going to pass just like a cloud. It'll come and go. Mm -hmm. And that to me is something um, that's just, I know I, I sound kind of sad speaking it, but I don't feel that way. It's just, um, it's just something really close to my heart but it's just phenomenal for me to be able to just feel content, even though I have some things that I'm kind of sad about. Right. And that's just right. the way it is. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Yeah, that's that, you know, you're, you're content because you're being so authentic with yourself. You're being so authentic with the present moment being so present with it. Yeah. Um, it was really wonderful for me. A couple of years ago, I looked up the actual, um, the actual like literal translation of kukucha, which is the that fourth hindrance in meditation of restlessness and um, uh, re remorse. Because like, like you, Toby, I'm a parent. And of course, there's things I've had a lot of remorse about. And, uh, but really coming to see the wisdom of the Buddha that, I, you know, being a Westerner, I've thought remorse is because I love and I care and, and, you know, I'm being honest with myself and um, taking responsibility. But in, in the Buddha's teaching, remorse really is a hindrance. It's not where the Buddha is saying to let your mind hang out because it is doing nobody any good, yourself and others. And the actual translation of that Pali word, kukucha, is wrong performedness. And I mean, we've all done that, right? We've all done things that if we had it to do over again, we could have done it differently or better or whatever. But in the Buddha's teachings, it's just see it, just touch in on it and be like, oh yeah. And then and then learn from it, learn from it, that you benefit and, and others benefit. So that's, that's really great what you're sharing, Toby. And so appreciate it. And I, and I think it's the hardest thing as a parent. And I think we've got time for one more voice. Is there someone who doesn't generally speak who would like to? Ah, okay. So, yeah. Please, please. Um, it was Gina and I can't. Sylvia, is Sil it Sylvia? Yes, Sylvia. Yeah, Sylvia. It's not that I usually don't speak. I usually speak. <laughs> All right, it's your it's your platform. Go for it. Uh -huh. I want I wanted to hold on this time, but I I couldn't. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, talking about being content, it's a big issue for me. I shouldn't complain about almost anything. But every day, I feel pain. 
for a little thing, a not so little thing, something that somebody said, some, something that's happened the way the world is. Everything makes me shaky. Every, everything is, a, it's not that I live in fear, but now more than ever, I know that it, it can happen like this. And, and I'm not here or somebody that I love, it's not here. Somebody that even I don't know, it's not here. So um, how to engage in learning, how to live without fear, how to know that fear is there and it may happen anything to, to a loved one or to yourself. And then uh, it's amazing because sometimes you go out from that and you can't believe it. It's like another world. It's like you went to the, to the space and suddenly you're in Mars. And, and, and I'm talking about uh, something very serious because Gina was, uh, she had cancer. She's in remission now, but I thought that the, my life was going to yeah. end with her. And, uh, and I was not suffering, it was she who was suffering. And, and to be able to, to learn to be alone, because I was much of the time alone, I said, you know what? You have to learn so many things in this life, which are so painful and so upsetting and so, but also uh, the other side of life, it's so beautiful. And I really think that beauty and goodness and, and learning, it's more on the good side and, and that's what we get. I really think that I get a lot of goodness of life. And, I, and I'm almost sure that everybody can say that we get many good things of life and we learn a lot. And I appreciate very much what you said, all of you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Uh, yeah, I, I'll just um, end with what you're sharing about beauty. Uh, I heard a monk say, uh, we have a human birth and we have come in contact with the Dhamma. It, it doesn't get, it does not get better than that. <laughs> and and I think um, that can be a, uh, a touchstone for us to, to return to cultivating contentment, to realize, oh, even when we're worried or fearful or anxious or overwhelmed or sad or confused, it all has a purpose because we're, we've come in contact with the Dhamma and we have, a, we, we have the potential mm -hmm to have a, a Dhammic perspective, which means anything that we're going through ha has tremendous potential, tremendous purpose, tremendous meaning. And there's the opportunity for growth and purification and greater wisdom and compassion. So, um, yeah, we'd, we'd like to end there and thank you so much for your practice and uh, for us sharing this time together. And uh, may we all continue to be growing, cultivating contentment and wisdom and compassion in our lives for ourselves and, and for all beings. Yeah. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah.